Hi, I'm Kate Kelly, and this is Ordinary Equality. You must remember that when the Constitution was written, that women were regarded as property. The struggle for an Equal Rights Amendment traces back to 1923 when feminist Alice Paul wrote the words that became ERA. Equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or any state on account of sex. So as we march today, remember, forward together, backward never. If you could change one thing about the Constitution, what would it be? I would add an Equal Rights Amendment to the Constitution. Right? Yes, 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 yes. Today, the House of Representatives cleared a hurdle to make the Equal Rights Amendment the 28th Amendment to the Constitution. The House voted to remove a deadline for states to ratify the amendment, which would guarantee women the same legal rights as men. Today we're talking about the mother of the ERA. In 1979, as her decades-long political career was finally winding down, Martha sat down with interviewers from the U.S. Association of Former Members of Congress. She ended up recording 165 pages of oral history. So in this episode, we're going to let Martha Wright Griffiths tell her own story. When Martha Edna Wright was born on January 29, 1912, American women couldn't vote. When she was eight years old, the 19th Amendment was ratified, granting women's suffrage to some, though certainly not all. Martha's family didn't have much. Her mother, Luella, believed that education was the path forward for an independent woman. When I was out of school in 1930, my father said to me, there is not money enough for you to go to school. There is only money enough for one and your brother will have to be educated. Sons are always educated. And when he had gone away, my mother said, and in this family, so will a daughter, because you are not going to marry and find then that husbands don't come with the guarantee that they will live forever. Throughout Martha's childhood, Luella worked extra jobs, saving for her daughter's future. She was a substitute rural mail carrier. My father was a rural mail carrier, and she was a substitute. She also finally took in boarders to help me through school. And it paid off. Martha was accepted to the University of Missouri and earned a political science degree. While there, she met Hicks Griffiths. They married when Martha was 21 years old. In 1934, Martha and Hicks both graduated from Mizzou, moved to Michigan, and attended law school. From the very beginning, he said, now you have to do something more than this. You can't waste your dreams. He urged me into law school, and he was always so enthusiastic, and he was always so helpful, and he was always so pleased with the smallest thing I did, which, you know, you enjoy. It was important. Martha went into practice with a friend from college and worked for the Defense Department for much of World War II. After the war was over, Martha felt pulled towards a different career path, politics. Her start in this new field wasn't easy. The very first thing I learned was that you cannot pay attention to what other people say. You cannot be dissuaded. You cannot try to answer the criticism. You have to proceed the way you think it should be done. She lost her first campaign in 1946. Somehow or other, I thought that, well, I announced for the state legislature. Everybody's going to know it. What I really found out was how little attention people paid to anything. They didn't know anything about it. I ran 46th or something, which is really remarkable in a field of 121 or some such thing. But of course, to me, it was just horrible. Afterward, I could see what you needed, and what I would have liked to have had was a neon sign that went up over my head saying, I'm Martha Griffiths, candidate for the state legislature, and just had it blinking all the time because you simply couldn't introduce yourself to a lot of people. And I wasn't at all backward about introducing myself. I could stop people on the street and tell them who I was, but that was not enough. Two years later, in 1948, she won a seat in the Michigan House of Representatives, where she served for two terms. In 1952, after a failed attempt at a U.S. congressional seat, Martha was appointed a judge in Detroit. She saw many criminal cases in her time on the bench and got insight into both sides of the law. 
I was never reversed. And I might say, you noted the other day that one of the judges tried 87 cases all year. I tried more than 3,000 in 10 months. In 1954, Martha decided to have another go at a congressional seat. She made something of a splash by employing what was at the time an unusual tactic, campaigning from a mobile trailer. All the Republicans got trailers afterwards, and all of them hired somebody to drive it. Well, I drove the trailer, and I'll tell you, it nearly killed us. I would get up about six o'clock in the morning, clean out the trailer. We served fruit juice, iced fruit juice. And I went about a mile and a half to buy the ice for the fruit juice. These girls, four girls, would come every morning. And by the time they got there, I had some coffee made and some sweet rolls so that they'd start out with that. And then we started. The men would come in, they would look around, they'd say, Lady, who's driving this thing? And I'd say, well, I drive it. Now, the trailer was 40 feet long. And they would say, well, if you care enough about my vote to drive this thing through Detroit traffic, give me some of that literature. I'll help you. And they'd take it. In 1954, Martha won her congressional race without the support of her state Democratic Party. She was only the second Michigan woman to be elected to the U.S. House. She would go on to run and win nine more times. As Martha settled into her new role as Congresswoman, she realized just how often and how brutally women were at the mercy of this country's laws. Reversing that inequity would become her lifelong fight. Well, as I looked at the law year after year after year, I realized that those laws were really loaded against women. No one had ever considered women. The housing law didn't consider women. Then I went on the tax subcommittee of Ways and Means in 1963, and I realized that the inheritance laws were really ridiculous. Martha, we should note here, was the first woman appointed to the powerful Ways and Means Committee, which basically deals with all things money. I had been born on a farm. I had known many people who lived on farms, and I knew well that many of the women that worked on farms worked as hard or harder than the men who lived there. And yet the women would possibly pay an inheritance tax on the farm, but not the men. It was never assumed that anything that the women had done really amounted to anything. I really just couldn't believe it. One of Martha's most important contributions came in 1964. The Judiciary Committee was debating the Civil Rights Act. Yes, I had intended from the beginning to offer an amendment which would include sex, but I really intended it to apply to the entire bill. However, on the Sunday before the bill was up, and I think it came up on a Tuesday, Howard K. Smith of Virginia, who was the chairman of the Rules Committee, was on one of those question and answer programs, or you know, significant issues or some such thing, and May Craig, who was a reporter from a Maine newspaper and who was in favor of the rights of women, asked Smith to offer an amendment which would include sex, and Smith agreed to do so. What I didn't realize was that Smith would offer it to only one section, and he offered it only to Title VII. It was too late to try to amend. I couldn't do both. I couldn't amend and then get the whole thing passed. So I went with what was there. Title VII barred employment discrimination on the basis of race, national origin, color, religion, and thanks to a last-minute amendment, sex. The senator who added sex to the bill, Howard K. Smith, likely added it because he thought it would mean the end of the entire bill. But Martha decided to call him on his bluff. And I always thanked him afterwards for our amendment. The amendment proved to be one of the most profound advances for women's rights in the 20th century. But Martha's biggest battle was for the Equal Rights Amendment. The ERA was first introduced in 1923 by Alice Paul. By the time Martha entered the House in 1955, she was convinced that passing the ERA was the only way to seriously improve women's rights. Every year, Martha brought forth the ERA just to watch the Judiciary Committee kill it. They were wrong. They were wrong on a lot of things, but on this, they were incredible. 
They simply didn't regard women as human beings. But I think you just had to look at it. You had to read the cases. Then finally, you simply had to say, well, something should be done. A little less than a bomb, but a little more than a case. And that's what the Equal Rights Amendment discharge was. So in 1970, Martha decided on a different tactic. She chose the discharge petition, a rarely used procedure that requires the majority of House support. There hadn't been a discharge petition filed, as I filed that one where the committee was successfully discharged, I think, but once before in the century. If Martha could get those 218 signatures, she could pull the ERA out of the Judiciary Committee and onto the floor for debate. I went to Hale Boggs, who was then the majority leader, and he was from Louisiana. And he said to me, now Martha, when you get to number 200, I'm going to sign it. I want to be number 200. For 40 days, Martha stalked her fellow representatives. Well, every day I went in and the first thing I did was to look at the discharge petition and see who had signed it. Then the next roll call that they had, I would go up, look again, look out in the group that was voting, go get them, lead them by the hand, down to sign the discharge petition. Finally, one day I went in and I had 199. So I rushed back to Hale and I said, Hale, please come quickly and sign it. And on August 10th, 1970, she opened it up for debate. In 1971, the ERA passed in the House. You see, they were all hunting excuses for why they voted for women. The real truth was that most of those men were very decent men in their heart. They knew they were wrong. They should help. The Constitution should apply to women. It's ridiculous that it doesn't. The following spring in 1972, it was approved by the Senate, but it was only ratified by 35 of the required 38 states and to this day has not yet become part of the Constitution. Well, I felt that I was going to win it. I can count as easily as anybody, and I had the votes counted. I just couldn't believe I wasn't going to win it. But other than that, I never thought of it, particularly as a vast historic moment, which it really was. I never thought of it in terms of, this is really the wave of tomorrow. I never considered that part. All I knew was that I had a job to do, and I had done it. In 1974, Martha decided not to run for an 11th term but in no way did she retire. She spent a few years as Michigan's lieutenant governor and kept practicing law. On her own tirelessness, she said, before I leave this earth, I would, I would like, like to know, know they that they have given women the same women benefits and promotions as men. All I want to be is human and American and have all the same rights. And I will shut up. Martha died on April 22nd, 2003. She was 91 years old. We'll be spotlighting one more incredible woman like Martha in our next episode. Next week, for our final episode, we'll be talking about and with Senator Pat Spearman. If you want to hear more about Martha, good news, I've got a new book out, also called Ordinary Equality. It goes into detail about each of the women we're talking about on this season and more we just couldn't get to. Buy it wherever you get your books. Ordinary Equality is a Wonder Media Network production. This episode was produced by Maddie Foley, Carmen Borca Carrillo, and Ale Tejeda. Thanks to the Library of Congress and the U.S. Association of Former Members of Congress. And thank you to Rachel Cunningham, who gave Martha her voice in this episode. I've reported other people's stories for a long time, confronting people in power. But behind this broadcast voice, I've hidden my greatest secret. I was in an abusive marriage. It lasted a year, but it changed my life. Part of me always blamed myself for what happened, and I've lived with the shame. So many of us live like this. It's time we change that. I'm Anna Maria Tremonti. 
Welcome to Paradise is My Story. Available now on CBC Listen and everywhere you get your podcasts.